had the chance to design a state secondary school from scratch, what would you put in it? You might begin by thinking, what do today's young people really need to make them play a positive role in society, to give them every chance of fulfilling their dreams, and to give them a foot ahead in the world of work? Here at Bath Studio School, we've had that privilege. Our school is designed to give students real-world skills, as well as the academic subjects that they need, supported by local businesses. We began teaching just four short weeks ago, and today marks the official opening of our school. You join us in our state-of-the-art TV studio, where the creative media students are being taught production skills, and they're going to be in charge of this broadcast today. They're operating the cameras, the lights, they've designed the set, they're presenting, and they're also in charge of the gallery. Before I hand over to the students, I want to introduce you to one of our supporters, uh, who is a well-known face on Sky News, Stephen Dixon. Before I hand over to the presenters, let's see a little bit of his work. Hello, I'm Stephen Dixon from Sky News, and I'm a very good evening. This is Live at Five. Brilliant. Thank you. Now, as we know, same-sex couples tying the knot across England and Wales today because it has become legal for them to marry. Tonight, Live at Five, the killer wave. One of the biggest earthquakes ever recorded sends a torrent across northeastern Japan, sweeping away everything in its path. It's all well and good to talk about getting addicted to these sort of things. I have to confess, I don't know anything about them. Some the papers for you this morning with theologian Vicky Beachy, comedian Ian Royce, back again. And we'll start, Vicky, with um, a christening to look forward to, should we? But who's going to be there? Total immersion reality sounds something that would only benefit hardcore gamers, but could the technology also be used to help us learn? Julia Hardy is here to tell us more as I see so there of Colonel Gaddafi being set alight. More on that and hopefully talking to Kim Sengupta, who's in Tripoli as well. Stay with us. Good afternoon, Stephen. Nice well to see you. <laughs> welcome to the Bath Studio School. Some inspirational footage back there, but for starters, where did it all begin? Um, I always had an interest in broadcast, yeah. um, more than I did journalism to begin with when I was sort of 15, 16. So I joined my local radio station, my, well, not local, the, the hospital radio station, so you could get in and I was just doing stuff behind the scenes with that, which was fascinating, not getting on air at all. Uh, but then I went and did a degree in Nottingham, Nottingham Trent University in broadcast yeah. journalism, and whilst I was doing that, started working at the local radio station and then continued that once I graduated. And from there went to ITN, and from there went to Channel 5, and from there went to Sky News. And how long did it take you to get to be a presenter? Well, it's difficult because in radio, you do everything. So I was reading bulletins as well as reporting and producing. You just, you take your turn, you do it all in rotation. So I was on air on the radio sort of fairly, at a fairly early age, by about 19, I guess. Um, TV-wise, oh, I don't know. Um, I guess probably uh, when I was at Five News, so that would be 97, so I'd be about 23. Oh. Stephen, <laughs> you've been presenting now for many years, obviously. Um, what do you enjoy the most about presenting? The live aspect. All right. The live aspect, because of all of this and what you guys are having to do now, which is think on your feet. Yeah. You know, you don't know what is going to happen. And if, should anything go wrong or should things dry up, you've got to keep going because you've got to keep going till the clock stops. Yeah. And that, for me, is always the great thrill because every day something goes wrong on air. Because when you're doing so much television, yeah. things are bound to go wrong. And so it's all the effort that I have to make and that my colleagues in the gallery and in the production office are having to make to keep us on air and to keep it going and to make it look like it was all meant to happen. Yeah. And that's always a thrill. And uh, what was the most fun thing you ever talked about? It's difficult to say mm -hmm. because there are so many different things that we get to cover. I'm very lucky that I obviously get to do a lot of hard news, which is my main focus but also entertainment news and showbiz news and, and all that sort of thing is always fun. Um, I guess it's a, it's a, um, it's a toss-up between uh, a, a show called Star Trek and I had, there's a, <laughs> the, the, there was a, the whole stuff called The Next Generation, which uh, was around 20 odd years ago now. But there was a key character in that, Chief O'Brien, who I had on the show about 18 months ago. 
and I got my little Star Trek badge out to put on <laughs> when I interviewed him. That, for me, was just a personal thrill. But also having people like Mike Reed on, who used to present um, a show called Saturday Superstore on the BBC every right. Saturday morning. Um, and as a kid, as a teenager, that's what you watched in the morning. And then now he is a regular guest on my show. Yeah. And so that is personally a bit of a thrill. <laughs> Um, how long does it take you to get ready for the morning news? Um, it, it de well, it depends what show you're on. If you're going in to do um, a show during the day, you get there two hours before to do the prep. Um, it's slightly different on sunrise because it's so early. My team start at nine o'clock at night and work through the night. I get to the office at quarter past five. Oh. Um, um, but because I've got a co-presenter, I've got Gillian Joseph who works with me. And so I only have to do my segment at the top yeah. and then she does a bulletin. So whenever Gillian's on, I then can prep for my next guest. All right. So I've got prep time while I'm on air. So it means I'm actually in slightly later. So my main focus in the morning is getting my makeup done. <laughs> so I don't look quite as tired as I feel. And you get a lot of guests. How many guests do you um, get? Yeah, I mean, it varies day to day, but you would aim for generally um, sort of three or four hits with reporters or correspondents every hour and then three or four st guests, studio guests or guests down the line during an hour. So you're talking, you know, 12, 18 a day. Yeah. And do you choose what you want to wear or do you have designers? I, I have a stylist. Mm -hmm. I, I say I, work provides a stylist. <laughs> um, we went through a stage, it didn't used to happen, but Sky decided that they wanted a look and a style, so they employed a stylist. So all of this gear is actually provided now, which is very, which is very nice. Our studio here, Stephen, it's it's quite small. It's not a very big studio. I imagine your studio is a lot a lot bigger than ours here. But I imagine we're using similar, you know, technical stuff here. But how many how many people is in the studio with you when you whilst you're presenting? Well, ours is a studio newsroom, yeah. so everybody is there. Yeah. Uh, in effect, and, and Sky is is very big. It is a, a very very big set. Um, in terms of people, uh, I've got a as well as the presenters. Obviously, you've got a floor manager, a camera operator. Well, two camera operators. One on the we've got a big jib. Uh, all the other cameras are robotic. They're called Radamex. Right. So there's there's one guy on the sticks who controls all the other cameras. So they whiz about the studio floor, yeah. um, and then you have. You know, I've got five people in my ear and, you know, 20 or 30 people in the newsroom. So every, everyone's around yeah. all the time, which is quite nice. In terms of size, Sky News is quite different because of the setup. This is not a small studio. All right. If you went to BBC News, the BBC News channel, you'd find the studio is smaller than this. Wow, really? Yeah. Well, thank you, Stephen. I believe we've actually got some questions from the audience now. Sam? Yeah. Um, what was it like having to cover the London bombings? Uh, very scary, actually. Most news that happens as a, as a professional journalist, you, you just sort of get on with it and think about it afterwards. Because that was something really horrific unfolding in a place where you, you are based at the time. Um, and it was a very confusing picture to begin with. But it was quite scary, actually. I imagine oh. it must have been quite difficult and you must have been quite distraught presenting it. Well, not distraught so much as just that's. I mean, you, you keep the face on yeah. and you keep going, but there is that element of thinking, what on earth is happening? Yeah. And when we had one of our producers who rang in, actually, we put him on the air because he'd just seen the, uh, the bus in, in Russell Square explode. And to get him on and, and having to get him to explain three or four times very clearly and specifically what he had seen, yeah. because you've under those circumstances where there is a possibility actually of viewers panicking at home, you've got to be very, very clear about what you're saying. And of course, the bus exploding, apart from what was happening on the tube, was the first indication that it was a, an attack yeah. rather than just an accident. And so that was something we were, we were very careful about. But it was one of those things that when, we, when I came off air at 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning, um, getting in the car and driving home was the worst thing because that, that's when it sinks in so it was um, it was not fun no I imagine not um, I think we've actually got another question from the audience Molly yeah how is Sky different work different to working at other channels um, Sky has a different attitude I think we are very um, 
oh, I, don't know how, I don't know how best to phrase it. Um, we're very forward thinking, I guess, in, in how we approach things. We're not scared to try things, and if they don't work, roll back on them. You know, we've tried shows in the past that don't work, and so you just ditch them and, and, and do something else. You know, we're quite dynamic in terms of music, in terms of graphics, in terms of the style of, of correspondence we, we have. Uh, and that's really exciting. And what always sort of pinpoints it for me is if there is a big news conference and all the reporters are gathered round, a police constable or whoever it is who's giving a, giving a statement or a politician, um, the first question, nine times out of ten, will be someone yelling out saying, I don't know, Joey Jones, Sky News, <laughs> or Rachel Younger, Sky News. And it's always Sky News first because we've got it inbuilt that when there's that sort of environment, you get in first. <laughs> Stephen, we all know that you've been presenting for quite a while now. Um, and I actually and feel very old. I'm yeah. just a young man. You, you, know. you don't look that old. <laughs> you don't look that old. But um, what, when, when you were, when you were, well, many years back when you first started, what actually, firstly, <laughs> what firstly inspired you to be a uh, journalist? I don't, well, I, I don't know. I always had a fascination, I say, with broadcast. Yeah. My grandfather. Uh, built a television, who built the first television in the town for the oh, coronation, right. yeah. uh, <laughs> many, many, many decades <laughs> ago, and was a very keen, uh, very keen on radio. He was a, he was an electrician at the local shipyard yeah. up in Barrow, so I had that interest and, with, and tied in with technology, which is very different to how yeah. it is today, but still an interest in technology, um, and so that was my driving force. It's when I went to Nottingham Trent University and started to learn about journalism. And actually that grabbed me and I realized that actually that was the passion. The passion was, was not only how you get a story across, but getting that story, getting the facts, getting the nitty gritty, putting people on the spot. There's nothing, you can't beat a good hard interview, no. you know, especially with a politician. And have you got a passion? Is, are you passionate about something? Generally, well, you know, if I've got to say anything, um, Science fiction, I am a geek. And so I love science, I love technology that is around today and I love technology that is maybe around in the future. That's a big driver for me. Um, I'm very passionate about health because I'm diabetic. And so I'm, a, and I, I'm very passionate about driving that forward. And I'm very passionate about education, partly because of my links with Nottingham Trent University where I'm, I'm president of the Alumni Association. That's, so that's everyone who's graduated from the university. So I'm very passionate about people making the most of their potential and then getting on in life and pursuing something. It's really important. You so, Stephen, you mentioned um, just then that you, you have diabetes. And what was life like growing up with diabetes? Well, I was 17. Yeah. So it wasn't too bad. You know, I had, I had all of those years being fine and never having to think about yeah. anything like that. And it kicked in just before I went to university. Yeah. Uh, and it's a challenge. It is a challenge, but it's like everything I see in life is you've got to make the most of a situation. Yeah. So I quite enjoy being a type 1 diabetic it gives, right. because you get a focus on your health and a focus yeah. on diet and you know, the checkups on the NHS that you get every year are beyond belief. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm prodded and poked to within an inch of my life, but I know I'm healthy. Yeah. So that's really important to me. So um, I, I see it as a challenge that I enjoy. You know, right. Bring it on, so I say. <laughs> And you're involved in a charity. How long has that been? Yeah, I've been involved with uh, Diabetes UK for quite a quite a few number of years now, uh, and also JDRF, which is uh, the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation. So I just, I, I mean, I, I do what they want me to do with things like that. You know, sometimes they don't they don't need any input, and sometimes they need you to go and you know present an award or you know host an event or whatever it is or you know, do something in the papers. So it's just whatever, you can be a tool for these people to use to their advantage. And it's quite nice yeah. to be able to think that you're, you're helping a little bit in that way. Yeah. And have you helped a lot of people? Well, it, I, I don't think you can claim credit, yeah. you know, as, as someone in my position for saying you, you help a lot of people directly. Because, but you open a doorway, I think, that allows other people to, to be more aware of, say, Diabetes UK or JDRF. And I do get quite a few, um, because I talk about it on air quite a lot, um, which is important for me to sort of, so people can see there is a, a type 1 diabetic who's sort of 
just doing an ordinary job and living an ordinary life. So I get quite a few emails and letters from, often from parents who've got diabetic children. Yeah. So I think it's just nice to see that it, there's someone else out there. Mm -hmm. So that's nice, very re rewarding to get that back. Stephen, you briefly mentioned that you studied at Nottingham Trent University. Yeah. What was it like back then at the university? Fantastic. But do you know what? It's partly why I'm intrigued with the Bath Studio School. Right. Because at the time, the Nottingham Trent University was launching a broadcast journalism degree. Yeah. And it was the first undergraduate degree of its kind in the country. Yeah. And I was on the first ever year. And so, and believe you me, we didn't have facilities like this yeah. in year one. It was all just being put together. But that new environment and the excitement that goes with it and mm. having uh, the course launched by John Snow from Channel 4 News, who was one of our visiting professors, was incredible. The excitement and the enthusiasm was absolutely phenomenal. But it reminds me of this so much because yeah. it's a new start and a new place. Definitely. And you've looked around, uh, do you enjoy it? The well, school? here, would you it's come amazing. Here? It is amazing. I'm, I'm blown away by what I've seen. Um, the technology for a kickoff, which is the, you know, the, the sort of cornerstone of what you need in this sort of place, is phenomenal. The fact you're, you're streaming everything everywhere and doing everything on your iPads, but you've got you know, PCs and Macs, so you're getting across all sort of technology bases, which is important. But the facilities, the space, the atmosphere, the attitude of all the students that I've met yeah. is really astounding. Yeah. I, I'd come here in a heartbeat. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, thank you, Stephen. I think we've actually got some more questions from the audience. Uh, Matt? Stephen, what would you consider to be your greatest achievement in journalism? Oh, that's a really tough one, isn't it? I do, do you know, if I'm honest, I don't know. I don't know. I think you've got to, it's such a fluid and flexible industry and job, um, I'd be very wary about saying what an, what an achievement was because you can, you can fall flat on your face the very next day and it all gets wiped out. So I think you've got to be careful. Um, but for me, I, I, I guess you could say you know, that, that I've, I've interviewed every Prime Minister since John Major and I've met and before that, I met Mar I've met Margaret Thatcher, uh, met her a number of times, um, and interviewed various prime ministers from other countries as well. Now, for me, as a, if you want to be a good journalist, you have to have an interest in politics. And um, I think all, you know, hanging about with the leader of a country is always inspiring. Whether you personally you know, would support that party or not is, is absolutely irrelevant. The prospect of of being with someone in that position is actually a great privilege and an honour and, um, and I love that. And I've been to number 10 a few times and that is just wonderful to soak up that history and heritage and atmosphere and shake hands with the Prime Minister is a, is a lovely experience and so the fact that my job has allowed me to do that over the years um, is great, I love it. Did you enjoy speaking to all the Prime Ministers? Then? Yeah, it's, it's actually very, very nerve-wracking yeah. because whenever you get someone of that calibre in, it's not what they want to talk about yeah. as much as you need to cover them on all the key issues right. that are going on you know, that day, that week, that month. You, know, you want to get a soundbite on every issue. Um, so, so it's always quite a big challenge. Um, and you want to be your best yeah. with, with that sort of guest. But it, it, it is an amazing privilege. Definitely. Actually, to think that you get to speak to the people who run the country yeah. is, is really nice. It's, re it's really special. Yeah. I think we've got another question from you once, Matt. Um, how closely do you work with the BBC and other news channels? Um, it's diff uh, difficult to say from my perspective, because what we do, what I do, not at all, in effect, but certainly as organisations, we do collaborate on issues. We do lots of things that are called pooled interviews or pooled footage where one of us will, will shoot something and it gets fed back to everybody. So we'll see from time to time, you know, sometimes we have the same interview or the same pictures. So there is those pooling of resources that happens. But of course you do get to meet colleagues from, from the other broadcasters and create some good friendships actually, which is a, which is a good thing. Never moan about another broadcaster because we all swap jobs from time to time. And so you might, well, you know, I might end up working for the BBC at some point. You just never know. No plans to, but you never know what might happen. So um, 
collaboration on every level can only be a good thing. Did you enjoy working at the BBC? Did you go from the BBC to Sky? No, no, I went from ITN to Sky. Oh, right, OK. Um, ITN was, it was an interesting time at ITN. I worked on um, the Morning News, which is an ITV show. Yeah. I was a producer on that. And then went over to Channel 5, which yeah. was still produced by ITN, right. actually, when it launched in 97. Um, and went over there as a senior producer and, and then started presenting. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it was a great place. It's, it's different to Sky, but it's, Sky yeah. is an evolution of ITN right. in a sense that a lot of the people who started Sky came over from ITN. Yeah. So, the, you know, there's a lot of collaboration. Yeah. Pe people do move, move about, and it, but it's great because you get to share resources and share skills and share experiences. So it, yeah. it all adds to, the, to better coverage all around, really. Definitely. I think we've got one more question from the audience. Anna. Um, are there any negatives about becoming a journalist or presenter? Um, the hours aren't good in that sense. You know, you have to work on sociable hours. My days are quite short now. As a presenter, you, you get the, the better side of the slice, if you like. Um, you know, I, I, I get to the office at five and I'm out the door at nine or ten, depending on what day it is. Um, so that's good, but I still have to get out of bed at three o'clock in the morning, which is not good. Um, and my, so my production team works through the night, and I, I spent five years working night shifts, which is not easy. It's not easy. But whatever show you do, whatever shift you're on as a presenter or a producer or a member of the gallery team, you are going to work funny hours. You know, you, there's, there's no good shift. You know, even if you, when I did news at 10 a few years ago, that meant I finished it, you know, I was getting to the office at 5 o'clock and finished at midnight. So I was getting home at half one in the morning. So nothing is perfect. You're not going to do a nine to five job, not a nine to five day. But that, to me, adds to the excitement of actually not living a normal life, but doing something that's a little bit on the edge. And Stephen, um, one last one. Um, do I'm sure we're wondering, what has been the highlight of your career, of your whole career? What's been the highlight? Still waiting for it. Still waiting for it. Oh. The, career, the career is still going on. Oh, right. And I don't know where it's going to end or what's yeah. going to happen. It's a you, mystery. You can't plan ahead. Yeah. So I'm just holding on for dear life and seeing what happens. We yeah. shall wait and see. That highlight will hopefully come just before I retire. Definitely. <laughs> Which won't be for a while. Not for a for very a long time. <laughs> time. About 60 years. Yeah, about 60 years, that's fair. Well, it was a pleasure to have you here. I think we all learnt a lot. And I hope you're going to come back and maybe help us with our broadcasting skills. I look forward <laughs> for, to the invitation. Well, thank you very much, Stephen. A pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> we'd like, wow! We'd like you to be our first um, sponsor in the sense of our, our facility, and this is going to be the Stephen Dixon Newsroom and Production Suite. Oh, wow! Thank you! Well, I'm gobsmacked. Thank you so, so much. What a real honour that is. And actually, that number might not be there for, for that long because if you guys, since you've been doing this for four weeks, I dread to think that you'll be ripping that down with your teeth <laughs> in a couple of years once you're out of there. But that is a real honour. Thank you very much. I'm really pleased.